for the property analysis this week, we're going to be looking at a 32-unit building in North Highlands, which is a part, uh, um, which is north of Sacramento or downtown Sacramento. It's actually still technically part of uh, Sacramento County, but it's it's distinguished itself from Sacramento as the North Highlands. Now, a couple of uh, particular things about this 32-unit building. Uh, this one is currently on the market, and it's been on the market for a while. And it's actually a property that I'm actually looking at for myself. I have a, I have about, I have to buy a, uh, a 3.1 million dollar property or larger, because um, I, I have a, a couple million dollars coming out of a 1031 exchange. Hasn't closed yet, but I'm already looking to place the money to make sure I don't get heavily taxed. Um, and like I've said in prior episodes, a lot of times I'll run depreciation calculations, and after a certain point, when my depreciation's out. I'll start looking at the possibility of unloading the property and exchanging it to something else and having the privilege of being able to wipe out my uh, ordinary income and capital gain all over again. So in particular, this 32-unit building that I'm looking at, in fact, Mark and I were at the property yesterday doing the walkthrough. Was it yesterday? No, no it, it was Monday. Was, it was Monday. It was but, Monday. But you know what? A lot of people don't know this is that if you contact me, I will do the walkthrough with you, whether it's initial walkthrough or the actual home inspection or whatever whatever's going on with the property unit i'll walk through it and then give you my opinion on from a management perspective on what needs to be done yeah as a matter of fact that was the whole reason of going through it it's as i run my numbers based upon in this case the, the listing agent uh past listing uh, an agent that i've done a lot of business with in sacramento he'd actually sent me 36 months uh, trailing, which is 33 years worth of data on operating expenses and income that I can kind of look through an audit. And based on that, I was able to go through, uh, get a letter of intent from a lender to make sure that this is something that they would make a loan on. And then the other sweet aspect of this is the property currently asking $3,350,000. I, I can pick it up for $200,000 less than what he's asking. This is some insider information from the listing agent that the owner allowed him to give out because the owner in this particular case also is in the position where they've um, depreciated, they've, dep they've taken all the depreciation, the depreciation out of the property they could take. They are kind of retired, they're moved on to Nevada, and they are actually in a position where they could sell it, have a huge capital gain, defer it, and then put that into some other performing property someplace else. So again, we talked about how the market's slowing down. These are these opportunities where a property that was once asking a 5% cap rate is now beginning to, or willing to unload it at close to a six cap. The property itself was advertised at a six cap, but after I ran my numbers, even at the $200,000 reduction in price, I was getting closer to a 5.88 cap. So again, it's still the high fives, but you know, not quite a six. But regardless, taking any property where you can reduce the price $200,000 because the timing is just right, is always something to look very closely at. And this is something that owners out there that might be deciding, well, should I sell my multifamily building or not? Um, I have cash flow from it, but I don't have write-off. You might be selling it at a lower price in this particular market now, but at the same time, those same dollars that you're gonna be yielding from the sale of that property, you'll be rolling into a property that immediately starts at a higher cap rate. So long story short, you'll be able to use it at a be able to use it on a property where you might be able to get a discount as well on what it was previously asking six months before or even 18 months before. So long story short, at a three million one hundred fifty thousand dollar purchase price with a 30 percent down payment, um, running it at the current income of roughly twenty eight thousand dollars a month, three hundred thirty nine thousand dollars a year. And then, of course, after taking a uh, vacancy factor of 5%, which by the way, that's the 5% vacancy factor that you, ha you have to use when underwriting a property for a loan. The actual effective vacancy might be zero, or the market vacancy might even be less than that. For example, if I took the market vacancy in that area, it would be closer to three. And again, these little minute changes make a huge difference, not only in cash flow, but valuation. So when I apply a 5% vacancy, I run the expenses from the 24 month trailing. Essentially, I'm running the building at a 45% operating expense. At a $3,150,000 down payment, I'm still starting out at a 1.33 debt service coverage at, or at, and a 5.88 cap rate. So let's put that in perspective. After I apply the interest rate to the 70% loan amount of a $3,150,000 loan, the net operating income is still 133% greater 
than the proposed mortgage, which means there's an immediate profit and a return on investment of 8.8%, 8.08%. So let's put that in perspective, $3,150,000 purchase price, you need about $980,000 to get it because of the down payment and the closing cost. And so the return on investment would be based on the $79,296 a year that it would be making after paying debt service. And so $79,296 over a out-of-pocket investment of $980,000, a little, a little under a million dollars, turns into an 8% return that because of the cost basis of the property or the purchase price of $3,180,000 would still put off a straight line depreciation before all the fancy accelerated depreciation is applied, a straight line depreciation of $91,616. So you have a $79,000 profit, but a 91, almost $92,000 tax write-off. So on paper, you have a $12,000 loss while still making uh, an 8% return. So that 8% return is actually higher because it doesn't involve taxation. And again, this is the main reason why people will sell properties they've had for years that has a cash flow, but potentially roll those, that equity into another income producing property where they're starting their depreciation all over again. Uh, of course, they'll take into consideration the cash flow they gave up versus the new cash flow they're making, making sure that they're at least equal to or greater than what they're giving up. But now with the component of the tax write-off, now they're keeping more because of the fact, simply put, it's not what you make, it's what you keep that really matters. And again, if you apply all the regular increases of uh, rent to the property, which in this case, I only applied 7% rental increases. I applied 7% rental increases for the simple fact that that's what we're kind of anticipating with other uh, rent control laws that are potentially down the pipe, which is talk for another episode. But if I apply a 7% rental increase, which actually will probably be closer to a 10% because it's a 7% rental increase plus a uh, CPI application to it is what is currently on the ballot then I'm still looking at a property that's jumping from a 5.88 to a 6.56 cap rate to a 7.28 cap rate to an 8.06 cap rate by hopefully 2022, which essentially means that the property could have an unrealized gain of roughly $1,082,000 within roughly a four-year period of time. Unrealized because, of course, you'd have to sell the property at that time, unload the cash flow at 1030 when exchange it into something else, and yada yada. Now, there's a couple of pictures that I put up of the property. One of the other uh, ancillary value adds about the property is if you look at it from an aerial standpoint, you'll notice that the property actually take, uh, it, it, um, it's, it's one big lot that's uh, in between, in the middle of four different streets. So there's not a lot of bordering properties except for a small sliver property. So what's kind of cool about that is not only will the property be a place to park my capital gain from a previously sold property while simultaneously sheltering the cash flow that I'm making from it, but it's actually that, that cash flow that I don't actually need, I could use towards soft costs or architectural fees to potentially re-entitle that property and double the unit count that's currently there. Again, that's. I'm not going to get into that right now. That's another topic for another time. But these are different things that I particularly look at as value adds whenever I'm looking at investing property. This is why everyone needs to work with Brian because he literally can't stop talking about this even with two <laughs> bells going off. Sorry like about He that. literally lives and breathes real estate investment. 